but everything need not be you know at the when you have a symmetry like this obviously you need to place them at the center but even here if you look at uh, if you look at this uh, i place this at the bottom one third i have the tree line at the top one third so that's the rule of thirds is still there somewhere here other kind of points of interest if you draw you have a square rectangle frame like this and you draw a diagonal you draw a diagonal this way or this way and you draw a you know a perpendicular line a line perpendicular this from this corner these are the two points of interest very similar to rule of thirds this is called a golden uh, rectangle the same picture which i shot if i cropped it and uh, you know keep this composition it meets that uh, kind of it still me so there are different ways of looking at your compositions that was at bandagarh a young male again the face the eyes are almost at that that's the point of interest people will look at eyes any whether it's man, whether it's people or whether it's animals or birds or anything people will look at the eyes first that should be the point of interest and that should be placed appropriately again these are these are general guidelines not necessarily you can have this at the center also it could look nice but uh, i'm giving you these guidelines were something which lot of photographers found much more interesting and that's how they became the guidelines a setting yeah so you do this when you are taking the picture or subsequently so so it it uh, see the pro the challenge comes when you are taking pictures of say static objects you are conscious of it you have the time you have the luxury of time to do that to be conscious of it takes a lot of practice it doesn't come just like that but when it comes to moving objects very very tough you still like for that for the whale which i showed you the killer whale which is jumping it is very far and i had a huge challenge focusing because uh, because you have a sea like that the camera doesn't know where it's where you want to focus it's there under the under the water but where do you want to focus the camera is not locking the focus because it's everything looks blank there so it's so it took after three or four trials to, uh, i had to stay there for one hour wait to get that perfect shot so it takes a lot of so for moving objects it can be challenging static objects so for moving objects what i normally do is after this i look at it and do a cropping which i'll come to cropping part also so this is a scene again a sunset scene in africa i wanted to have see the show the elephant with its habitat again the elephant was the main, main subject with the backdrop so it's at a point of interest <coughs> breathing space though i have shown some bird photographs here it applies for people also what is breathing space that's a nice lilac breasted roller a beautiful bird with a lot of brilliant colors but there's something in this frame which makes it really not not so good it feels claustrophobic the bird is there it's looking at this side the frame is too tight it's not at the right position because it doesn't seem to have be having a breathing space that's not a right composition so but when you come to a bird like this this is a purple moor hen again a common bird which is found in lot of you know uh, wetlands it's moving like this a lot of breathing space here much better composition it applies to flying birds again they are flying in this direction these are black headed ibises i got this at uh, close to my house in gurgaon when i was in gurgaon a nice uh, synchronous synchronous movement Uh, but then they are flying in this direction so obviously you have to leave space here for them uh, for, for us to get that sense of movement if i if i had cut it here it would be very very con you know restricted it won't convey the sense of movement also again, but then again when you have you know two elements like this lilac breasted rollers again you can put them in the center of the frame you can have this kind of a composition not necessary that you have that space both are looking into each other so that's fine 
they still have space. A lot of times we, you know, most of our photographs, if you go and review, we'll have a lot of distractions, a lot of unwanted elements. Let me show you with an example. A nice, big male yawning, what a sight it could be. But what is the problem here? It's not clear because this, is, this bloody branch or that is distracting me. This is distracting. Beautiful bird again. This is the crown crane. It's a national bird of Uganda. It's also found in many other parts of Africa. Of a lovely bird. And when you see this, I mean, you really get so motivated to shoot birds. But what is the problem here? Again, distractions. These branches. These are distractions. So I should have waited maybe for it to come out of that maybe more, get into a more clear clearing and then take its picture. See, one of the things, <laughs> I am reminded of a couple of lessons, which early lessons which I've learned. See, a lot of us go to national parks. And national parks, especially tigers, we're so tiger obsessed sometimes. We don't find it. I've seen so many tourists go to national parks and come back uh, unsatisfied. Come back, bloody, dikha nahi yaar. Tiger dikha nahi. Kya bekar hai. Do safari kiye, ek safari kiye, paan safari kiye, nahi dikha. I mean, but there's so much of other action that happens in the jungles that we don't seem to pause and appreciate. This was one of... I was more thrilled to see this site, which is a rarity today, than seeing a tiger in the forest. Of course, I've enjoyed that, but you know, what is the problem here? This big distraction, this big distraction. Otherwise, it would have been a dream shot. And I didn't know, you know, in fact, I recollect uh, what happened there. We were there in this jeep, uh, suddenly found a mongoose hovering around. There's a big log in front, front of this here. We didn't see the snakes. And then, you know, the mongoose started climbing down from somewhere, and we were seeing what's, what's going to happen. And suddenly, we find two heads rise up. A, a thrilling moment. And then, unfortunately, because a uh, lot, uh, lot of people, even today, you must have read about uh, Ravindra Jadeja, the cricketer. He's booked because he took a selfie getting down his Jeep in gear uh, with the lions, breaking the law. So a lot of people, a lot of tourists, even you know, educated ones, don't have that, uh, you know, don't uh, follow certain protocols in the jungle. You can't do, be doing that. Here also the guy, couple of guys from the jeep got down, and the, and the whole scene, which was building up, got disturbed, the, 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 the snakes went away, the, and then the mongoos went away. Otherwise, we would have seen a nice confrontation uh, it would have been a very, very interesting, you know, episode that we could have shot. This was about five, and this was also one of the reasons why I started taking photography seriously. When you have, you have an image which could have been much, much better at a different, uh, you know, from a different angle. Cropping, very, very essential piece. Why we should crop? We should look at crop, cropping pictures. Here is a scene where you have this crested serpent eagles. Crested serpent eagles are found in jungles again. The favorite food is snakes. The name suggests that. You see the scene, very distracting. Over, you know, if this is there in the shadow, this is there in light, this is over, blown out. And you crop it to a frame like this, much better, much more balance. Catch light. Again, this applies to people shots. A pied kingfisher, a beautiful pied kingfisher. Kingfisher, there are many varieties which are so beautiful. In fact, one of the resident kingfishers for of Maharashtra called Oriental Dwarf Kingfisher, found in mostly in the Konkan Chiplun area, 
is uh, in the top 10 most beautiful birds in India. Such amazing colors it has got. This is a pied kingfisher, again, a little more common than oriental dwarf kingfisher. But to give you an example of cast light, again, this is a nice bird with, you know, you can see a lot of features here, a lot of details here, but lifeless. Eyes don't, you know, eyes are not, it's as if there's no life. A little shift, you can see that little, little white dot in the eye. Basically, it's nothing but the reflection of light from the eye. And it is a lot more life. This applies for people also. When you're shooting people, when you're shooting especially kids, a twinkle in their eye, you know, makes or breaks the image. Another example, a newborn. Again, this was not with a DSLR, this was with a normal point and shoot camera. I've digitally actually taken out the tweak, twinkle, but you can see the, the difference. Massive. Very lifeless, very lively. That, that small tweak, twinkle in the eye. So, so, you know, whenever you're shooting, keep, look at, you know, after you take the image, whether that's visible or not, whether the catch light is there or not in the image, uh, or, you know, that's very, very important. Focusing on eyes. That's where the connect happens with the viewer. See, as a photographer, I'm making the connect with the subject. And as a viewer of the photograph, you are making a connect with the subject if you're focusing on eyes. Most of the life subjects, or whether it's animals, birds, or people, eyes is where the focus should be. Not a perfect shot, because I, couldn't, uh, I had a, a, a fixed lens, so this tail got cut, because uh, I couldn't move my lens back or forward. But these are some of the moments, you know, when the tiger is staring directly at you. Uh, you know, some of those magical moments. Head, head done. Again, this applies, though I have given a bird example here, this applies for candid photography. When you're making some candid photography or a random photography on street, never do this when the head is that side. Head turns. A, a very, very different, you know, effect of the image. What's the problem here? Space. Space, yes. And a lot of, it looks, it's being obstructed with these. When it's looking in that direction, a lot of obstructions. It, how much better? Free, no obstructions. Angles. A nice image of a monument or a architectural you know, a building. Straightforward. Nice one, but nothing great. Nothing very, you know, impactful about it. Go a little forward, change your angle, see it. You have the sky. Of course, in this, it's not, you know, if you see on the computer, it's a, it's a little different in terms of colors. The sky, the whole geometry, the perspective is very different. So look at angles. Even it applies, say, for common photographs like these. Uh, you know, you're having a group photograph taken like this, uh, which is nice, but with a nice setting, but nothing very, you know, different. I place the camera on the ground. A lot more dramatic. A lot more dramatic. Look at angles. So as photographers, we all, you know, we have the camera like this. We try to, you know, shoot from wherever we are. We don't try to sit. You see a lot of, lot of people, you know, why is this guy, you know, doing like this? Why is this guy doing like that? Why is, what is he trying to? No, angles can make magical pictures. Some sleep on the road take some, you know, uh, so, so some of the uh, shots, uh, examples coming forward, I'll show you that. Eye level shooting. Now, here is a bird, a nice, it's, it's a flower. Now, when you shoot that, at that, from a, from a vehicle or from a standing position, you get that kind of an angle. 
Now, what happens with that kind of an angle is the background is all grass, and some of it comes into the frame. It doesn't stand out. The, the bird doesn't stand out. When you go down, in this position, go, it, go to its eye level, shoot, the background goes into infinity. goes into infinity. And then you get a blurred background. The subject stands out. Similarly, a nice scene, a beautiful scene, a beautiful moment between two spotted owlets. But then this is, ma this is spoiled by this background. Why this background? Because my shooting angle is like this, almost at 45 degrees. It goes into the sky bright sky, uh, too bright, it doesn't give a great feel to the image. So for this, that's a much better. Come back, shoot at a lower angle, you get a far more, you know, better, better image than this. But for that, of course, you need a length with, with a long focal length. <coughs> so these are some of the examples of eye level like this bird, starling. One of my favorite shots, this is an Indian eagle owl, which uh, was taken in the dark at uh, about 7, 7 odd uh, PM, where I had to literally scrouch on the ground and stop our jeep and you know do a lot of uh, uh, experiments with the angle. It gives you just a few seconds before it flies away. So very, very difficult. Birds are very difficult subjects to shoot. Very, very difficult subjects. Flying birds, this is uh, a stilt, which is a very common bird. So again, eye level applies even for people, especially kids. You go down and shoot them. Some are not necessarily at eye level. What kind of situations? You have silhouettes like this. This is in Rajasthan in uh, Jaisalmer, where you have the sun in the backdrop, camels. When you are shooting silhouettes, whether it's people or camels, you need the sky and uh, you know to be the backdrop, and as much sky as possible, so that the silhouette stands out. If you're going to go to, uh, at eye level or even at a higher level, you're going to get a half background. And that is not going to be, make your silhouette. So you have to go down, really, and shoot, below the, much below the eye level. Frames and symmetries. Frames, let me give you an example. So in nature, we find a lot of frames, natural frames. So you have a subject in the background. You have a, a frame in the fore, foreground. You can use those frames to create images like this. or like these. Use them as natural frames. They look really nice. Symmetry. Sometimes shooting them straight, I could have taken a picture like this, which would have given me a rectangular perspective. This gives a very different perspective. Though it's not a perfect shot because this portion was cut, I couldn't go further behind because there was a parapet. but. Again, when we talk about symmetry, it's about having that balance, especially reflections. You know, when you have landscapes with reflections, those are natural symmetries that you get. A lot of trees, leaves, flowers, you get a lot of natural symmetries. But sometimes it's not necessary to have a you know, perfect symmetry. You, can, you have a picture like this, you can break the symmetry and create a composition like that especially in flowers. <laughs> background. Background is a most, one of the most ignored pieces, as you know, we have seen earlier also. This, doesn't, this is a beautiful bird 
uh, a, a red start, black red, red start, but the background is not complementing the subject. Another example, scaly breast pneumonias, I was there shooting this, the background is sky, you know, sky is bright, these details are not coming out, the eyes and all are not visible, and back, it doesn't complement the subject at all. I shift a little bit, see that there is a tree behind, I get a very, very different image, which is much more impactful, much more lively. A weaver bird leaving its nest. Again, I had to see that there was a shrub behind at a distance where I can get that blur, and this stands out. It's not just close-up shots, but even in landscapes. So here is a Kacha road, which is looking very nice, which I wanted to shoot. I just juxtaposed it with a modern bridge like this Golden Gate. It gives a contrast, cost contrasting roadways. You have a Kacha road with a very ultra-modern road. So this complements the whole scene. Foreground. The example which we have seen earlier, having that element in the foreground. Sometimes we ignore foregrounds also. So this is a nice waterfall, but I deliberately have this in the foreground, which adds to the image. From Pangong Lake to, to get that, you know, to get that feeling of freezing ice, I have this in the foreground. If I just had an image like this, it would still be looking Dull, not so impact, but having this in the foreground conveys a little different meaning, little more feeling. This is Udaipur's lake palace. Having these little parts of the tree in the foreground gives again a different feel to the image. So foreground, th those are very very, you know, uh, foreground is also an important aspect. Leading lines and curves. Where is this? Worldly ceiling. Worldly ceiling. So see, a lot of uh, times we have lines in photograph, lines or curves. Now lines take you through a scene. They draw you into the scene. When you, when you click, when you have lines, they draw you into the scene, especially when the lines are radiating from the diagonal, from the corners. Or roads like these. This is at, uh, you can see a small car here. Yeah. A beautiful setting. So, you, you know, when the, when the viewer sees it, he scans the whole image along the lines. Lines, if you see again, the lines have placed them towards the corner, not towards the center. That, you know, draws you into the scene. That conveys depth also. Even buildings, when a road, these form natural lines and draw you into the scene. Gautam, the previous one, if you can take us, explain the science behind this. So, what, 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 is, what are you trying to convey here? So here is basically, you know, it's a, it's a scene. It's, it's just a plain, simple scene. What I'm trying to convey here is, if you have a subject here, that's my point of interest. And the viewer kind of goes through while he scans, he goes through the along the lines to the to the, to the to the subject, and then he's you know he, he scans through the image along the lines, okay. and then gets into the other parts. Very powerful lines, depth and scale. Sometimes you know you need to place elements at different parts of your image at different places of your image to convey the depth. Here, we have a series of these. Oracles. Uh, yes, those boats, yeah, round boats, yeah. to convey the depth. You have a vista like that, in terms of scale. You have a beautiful vista, but you're not, you don't know, you know, okay, nice, but what is the sense you're getting? Unless you have a set of trekkers like that walking, that's a different scale. This is at uh, uh, 
No, this is a, this, the famous glacier in Switzerland, uh, Alice Glacier. When when you see, look from the, the Jungfrau, Jungfrau, yeah. So, but then that you know having that gives you a sense of the whole scale. Similarly, trees. It doesn't. You won't be able to recognize the scale unless you have a reference. We all ha like to have references, and references usually are the ones which we normally see. So human you know, elements form a very good reference when it comes to scale. So if, if I didn't have that person there, difficult to imagine the scale of this or the size of this. And finally, though there are many other, uh, which I've, I've covered mostly the common ones, simplicity is the key. As simple as possible, with not too much of clutter, that is very, very impactful. With that, I come mainly now to the fundamental concepts of uh, a camera. So I'm just covering one of the main ones. There are so many things. It's a, it's a vast subject. Obviously, I can't squeeze in in a short time like this. But I'll just take you through the, the most fundamental ones which you should be knowing uh, you know, before you start. How many of you have DSLRs? How many of you click DSLRs on auto mode? <laughs> <laughs> so that, so so you don't need a DSLR if you want to click on an auto mode. There are far better cameras than a DSLR. So, but then when you're using DSLRs, or absolutely, the first, the fundamental of a, you know, on the on the technical side is this piece, exposure triangle. What is exposure triangle? Basically, there are three elements of an exposure controlling, uh, to control your exposure. The aperture. Aperture is nothing but the opening in the lens through which light comes and falls on the sensor. Speed of the shutter. That is, uh, the image sensor has a shutter. The moment you open the shutter, light falls on the sensor and then the shutter gets closed. And then image processes, processes the image. And then ISO. ISO is, we'll go into detail of each. The, 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 the main part is when, what is, what is the meaning of exposure? The quantum of light that falls on the film. So it's basically how dark or how light is the image. Okay. All three of them have a direct impact on on the on the on the exposure, but along with that impact, they have they do something some other things with the image, which is here, like aperture depth of field, shutter speed is about motion blur or motion freeze, ISO is about noise. We'll we'll look at it individually, uh, and before I go into each of them, just a quick reminder of uh, you know your physics lessons uh, way back, focal length. Focal length is nothing but uh, when light comes into the camera lens, it converges at one point, and then a reverse image is formed on the sensor, like this. So this is the image, this is the subject, this is the lens, this is the sensor of the camera. At this, this is the angle of view. It converges at a point, and then falls on this. So wherever it is converging, and where the image sensor is, the, this distance is the focal length. Now, why is focal length important? That is one of the specifications of a lens. What is the focal length of the lens? OK? Let's see how they impact each other. First one, aperture. As I said, aperture is this opening. It's like our pupil of the eyes. How much light, bigger the opening, more the light, smaller the opening, lesser the light. Now, there are certain numbers here. Don't worry about the mathematics of the numbers. This is basically nothing but these are called f-stops. The size or the opening size is denoted by an f-stop. This number is actually a ratio of this diameter and the focal length, which we saw earlier. 
So irrespective, so, so if you see a camera with a large focal length needs to have a big aperture opening to have the same exposure as a camera with or, or a lens which is short focal length, small lens, uh, it, it can have a smaller, much smaller aperture size. So you see those bazooka lenses which people use for birds, those are long focal length lens. Why they are uh, why they are so much big in size? Because their aperture is, needs to be bigger, because their focal length needs to be bigger, because they need to get that magnification, and so their size is huge. So what it does here? Just remember that you know this is 1.4, 2.8. Every alternate is a double of that. Two, four. Each is one stop of light. Now, what is the meaning of one stop of light? At each value or the size of the aperture, light either doubles or halves the intensity of light. So between 1.4 and 2. Yes. So that is so. 1.4 will have double the amount of light than 2. Than two. two 2 will have double the amount of light than 2.8. This is what is also mentioned. The maximum aperture is mentioned in the specification of a lens or a camera, of a, of a you know, mostly of the lens. Second is shutter speed. Same effect. You know, this is again denoted in terms of seconds. The, the fundamentally simple, the longer the more time the shutter is open, the more light it allows. The less time it is open, the less light it allows. In terms of time, it is in seconds. So it is half a second, one fourth second, one eighth second, one fifteenth second. So if you see these also, this go also goes in a progression of double. You know, half halving the time, doubles and half. So half second is uh, twice of one fourth second. One fourth is twice of one eighth second. So, whatever light this allows, this will be half. Whatever this allows, this will be half. So, similar to aperture, it has got this, you know, uh, denotions which you can see where you can understand the intensity of light, whether it's uh, half or you know full, you get ISO. Again, ISO is nothing but the sensitivity of the image sensor to light. The more sensitivity is, the more light it allows. So it starts with something like 50, 100, 200, again goes in doubles. Each value is, so 50 allows uh, the least amount of light, 25,000 allows the maximum amount of light. So if you see all the three interplay in terms of exposure. But they have other effects. Before going to that, let, let's see, let's take an example here. So you have an image where you have set f8 as the aperture size. ISO is 100. It's a daylight 100. And camera tells you that for giving, getting a proper exposure, properly seen for the scene, you need to have a 1 by 250th of a second shutter speed. Now, if you if you want to change the aperture for some reason, that is increasing, if you go to f4, it increases by two times. You know, f8 is, f5.6 is twice f8, f4 is twice. So two stops you are increasing. So to come, to get the same exposure, you need to go two stops down on shutter speed, which means you need to increase the shutter speed faster, make it faster to get the same exposure, same light intensity. Suppose you, you know, you want to see that, you know, I want F8 only, but I want a faster shutter speed because there is some actions going on there. To get the proper exposure, I need to then increase this. If I go there two stops, I need to increase ISO by two stops. It, this is the fundamental. As long as you understand this interplay, 
it's going to be very difficult technically to control the camera and what you want to do the camera in terms of exposure. Don't get overwhelmed. This is, you know, once you start, once it is registered, start experimenting, you'll probably understand it much better. Depth of field. Aperture impacts depth of field. What is depth of field? Depth of field is nothing but how much of uh, the image is within focus. So if you see this image, focus is on this small girl. It starts slowly blurring, blurring, blurring behind. So it's a very shallow depth of field uh, where you know it's just focusing on this. And as you have the largest aperture, let's say 1.8, you'll have the most shallow depth of field. As you start increasing the aperture, reducing the aperture rather, 2.8, you see slowly the background is starting to get visible, which means the field depth is increasing. Why do you want, why is depth of field important? Again, to highlight your subject and to blur your background so that you can get a much, much focus, much, much more focused subject, especially for portraits, wildlife, very, very important. Selective focus like this, I've focused on this particular, and these are into the background which are blurred, or if I go into the second one, I've selected the focus here. This is blurred, this is blurred. So it depends on what the photographer wants to highlight in the image. In depth of field, if the image say, let's say, this is the largest aperture, this photograph is trying to photograph this cat at the largest aperture, at this image, this is the depth of field. As he reduces the aperture, the depth of field, both in front, Go and back increases. It's not that from the image it goes, increases back. The image is in the middle. Both front of the image and back of the image, it increases. Now why that's important? Sometimes you have different sub elements of the, you know, you have a ducks in the pond. So say there are some ducks here, some ducks a little behind. You want all of them in focus, but the background to be in blood. So you need to know, understand the depth of field there very well. Shallow depth of field, as I said, portraits, birds, wildlife like this, where the background is blurred completely. Macro, very, very close-ups, or even candid photos. Recognize them? <laughs> <laughs> That's Manoj and Shailendra. Large depth of field, again, for landscapes, you need everything in the landscape to be seen visible clearly or even group photos where you want a, the background also to be highlighted. You need, you know, you need to get the background also in detail. So you have, you need a large depth of field or even, uh, you know, have wildlife shots where you are showing the habitat. Shutter speed. Shutter speed, like in this case, one by two thousandths of a second. The aperture was at 4.5, ISO 900. That was the setting for this. I get a, expo for the same exposure, at a much slower shutter speed, a very different feel of the image. Uh, one question, Gautam. Yeah. Uh, suppose you want motion freeze. Yes. So you reduce the shutter speed. Yes. That's to increase the shutter speed. If you want motion freeze, you... Increase the shutter speed. Incre no, inc reduce the shutter, uh, increase the shutter speed. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying in a camera, yeah. the camera will indicate to you the aperture and the so ISO. I'm just coming to the, that point of, uh, you know, a little okay. after this. I'm just first giving a, this thing of why, how the effects of shutter speed. So here is 20 seconds. Here is 1 by, 2000, 1 by 20 of a second. This is 1 by 2,000 of a second. In terms of stops, not in terms of 1 by 20 and 1 by 2,000, that's 100 times. In terms of stops, this is about six and a half stops, less than this. So I had to compensate that by reducing the aperture size to f22 
to get the same exposure and playing around with the reducing the ISO by three stop, five, four stops here and three stops there. So I get the same exposure, which means the same amount of light, but the treatment of the image is very, very different. Fast action, birds, birds in flight, you want to capture, that's an Indian roller, a beautiful bird, state bird of many, many states, beautiful colors, one by thousand of a second, one by 1250 of a second, there's a marsh harrier. Black bucks, very difficult subjects, very fast. So out of 20 attempts, I got one which was perfectly in focus. So 300 mm is the focal length of the lens which I used to get that magnification or that, you know, how close or I can get to the subject. The zooming. So basically it's the focal, as we said, focal length is the, you know, how close you, you can get to the image. Yeah. Zooming will come when you have a variable focal length lens where you have 200 mm to 400 mm, let's say. So the magnification there is or it's called 2x. You, all of you are aware of the you know, 5x camera, 10x camera, 10 multiples. So th that's the magnif magnification in a digital camera, normal point and shoot. But when it comes to DSLR, it's slightly different. The magnitude of magnification varies between, say, 100 mm to 200 mm may not be exactly double. It could be 1.3, 1.4 times. But especially when you want to shoot birds, you, I need a lens which is at least 400 mm, at least. If I want to shoot wildlife, that's why you have, you know, in the, I don't know how many of you have seen, uh, have some, uh, this, so, have read something about lenses. Wildlife, when it comes to larger subjects like tigers or lions or those kind of subjects, you have the lens which is 70, 200, 70 is the minimum focal length. 200 is the largest focal length. That is the most popular lens. Or even slow, slow shutter speeds, especially in night. You need to really slow down the shutter. Here, I, had, I slowed down the shutter so much to 20 seconds because I wanted to get the clouds like a flowing feel. On a tripod? On a, I didn't I have carried the tripod at that time. I had a a natural uh, ledge or something on which I placed. You need a tripod, yes, for, see, the, one of the golden rules of a tripod is, or handheld shooting especially is, if your lens, he says, for example, 300 mm is my lens, which I use for some other, for, for close action photographs. If I want to get a blur-free photograph, I need to use uh, you know, a shutter speed of at least 1 by 300. That's a thumb rule. If I have a shot lens which is 70 mm, I need to use at least 1 by 70 of a second to get a blur-free picture. That's a thumb rule. And most of the night shots, so even, even I, you know, even if it is not a, uh, you know, um, even if you got sufficient shut shutter speed, it's still good to, as far as possible, shoot with tripods. That will ensure most of your, you know, images to be blur free. ISO, noise, ISO comes, you know, though it uh, increases the sensitivity of uh, the image sensor to get more light. One of the problems, the more ISO you set, you see this nice setting here, a leopard on a rock, a lot of grains. You can see the lot of grains here because I shot it at 6,400 ISO. Normally, for daylight, 100 ISO is sufficient. To, uh, indoors, it goes to 600, 800 kind of ISO. Beyond 800, you start really getting noise. This is one of the key differentiators between normal cameras and high-end cameras. Normal cameras, point and shoot, digital cameras with, you know, as soon as the ISO starts getting more than 600, you get a lot of noise. Higher end cameras up to 3000 ISO, they're still noise free. You get still usable images. So just a recap. Is there, is there a relationship between the earlier ASA of the speeds and the 
So, uh, so it, for you know, it's very similar in terms of concept. You had the films, which were sensitive to certain, the chemicals. Yeah, absolutely. But the digital ISO is slightly different, though the phenomena is very, very similar. The, the effects are very similar. This is in the digital you know, space. That was you know, using chemicals and the sensitivity of the film to the chemicals. So both are technically different in terms of how the sensitivity was manipulated. But in, digital, in terms of effect, both are same. The no, there was noise if it was at a higher sensitive film. So no, see that's what I'm I'm coming to this. You know when I when I explained about this uh, triangle. Okay. Let me just yeah. When I explained about this triangle, you see for sports you really need fast shutter speeds. When you when you want those kind of fast shutter speeds. You know, when you set your aperture, let's say at f8, your image may come dark. If you want, you know, sports, this thing, very close up sports shots, you want to set it at f2.8, you, you know, you can, you can then reduce your ISO. But if you are f, at f8, you need to increase the ISO. So it's all an interplay between these and the capability of what maximum the camera is specified to do for. A lot of times, this is the most important part, piece. As I said, you know, larger aperture cameras or lenses rather are more and more expensive. Okay. So, the, with this, you know, fundamental understanding of these three, this is the most important one. There are many other features that the camera does, which I'm not going to get into today, because there are, you know, it will be very heavy. Once you start understanding these three, probably then there's the next progression of what other things that the camera does, uh, and how do we, you know, how do we manage images. Just before we, I end, there's one piece which I wanted to just quickly take you through. Pre-visualization of a scene. I mean, uh, there are 18 parameters in the camera before you can press the shutter to get your image. 18 different settings. We have covered uh, just five or six of them today, but most important ones. And uh, especially in wildlife, birds and things, you get just not more than three, four seconds to get your shot right. So you need to visualize the scene uh, pre before, let me just give you a simple example. Here is a scene where I've seen, you know, there's a, there's a Mount Kilimanjaro here, nice acacia trees. I've seen while going here, a group of elephants coming. So I wanted to take a shot with the backdrop of uh, Kilimanjaro, the acacia trees, and the elephants. Uh, this was at mid noon, so then I had to set, visualize that, and set my settings as, OK, ISO so much. I need everything, both the foreground and background, clear. So F9, shutter speed, because they are moving subjects, set it high. Focal length was 95 mm. Mid ring is a big subject I won't get into. It's basically how the, how the camera leads light uh, and meters light. So all those parameters I had to set to get an image like this. Wow. This is not a with a with a very high-end uh, DSLR, it was with an entry-level DSLR. Uh, so you can get very good images of uh, with a backdrop of uh, Kilimanjaro like this and elephants in front of them. Uh, with even normal cameras, as long as you are able to visualize that scene, make your settings right, get your settings right in the camera. Uh, I'll not get into too much of an equipment, but. Uh, you know, any anything, any equipment is good to start with, but fundamentally you must understand these the exposure triangle, 
the and there are more many more other things that uh, in the camera that you should understand at least the exposure triangle before you start going and you know trying to acquire a lot of equipment one of the problems megapixel i've got the best megapixel camera phone and so on megapixel doesn't it's the sensor of the camera because sensor of the camera is the most important piece uh, i use a full frame camera equivalent to 36 by 40 i mean the old 35 mm format 36 mm by 25 mm so uh, a lot of sensors especially in the mobile phones are very small so whenever you whenever you're interested in you know knowing the quality of the camera inside your phone or your or if you're buying a small camera look at the sensor size that's more important than the megapixel megapixel will only give you print size a lot of things in photography especially when it comes to equipment is a compromise you are, there's no one fix all kind of a, a you know a camera a lot of things uh, whether it's focal length or uh, aperture sizes of lenses the sensor sizes of camera all those are it's a compromise it's a, it's a very expensive hobby also when you start getting into building into more and more high end lenses the equipment again depends on what kind of genre you want to shoot you want to shoot birds you need uh, those local lenses your landscapes you need those wide angle lenses i have one wide angle lens and one mid medium photo you know medium focal length uh, for birds basically it's all about exploiting the advantages which you have and limitations working around the limitations final comment learn the basics experiment as much as possible on the on your images look at compositions that we have looked at all through the talk and then you know make uh, your equipment choices by the genre you want to shoot mostly for street or normal you don't need a very very high end camera a normal camera will be sufficient and use it as a meaningful expression to express yourself thank you so much hopefully it's a, it's a it's a little it's a little heavy subject i know but what i've tried to do here is look at mostly the composition side and light side so that because different people have different kinds of use different kinds of cameras whether it's phone or mobile when it comes to dslrs there's a lot of uh, other technical aspects which uh, one needs to get into uh, you know before understanding your camera very very well so thanks a lot for sparing your time hopefully you can have got a little bit of maybe uh, a little more knowledge or or tips i would say that you could get in trying to make images i thank the platform of uh, of coffee and conversations uh, and uh, especially manish gurdeep ji manish was really vocal that this is my first uh, talk on a photo on photography i have never given a talk on photography so <laughs> thanks manish and thanks uh, to coffee and conversations team ji varun is the one who was so 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 yes questions please any questions uh, did you have a uh, uh, presentation in mind when you especially clicked the sorry sachin here uh, did you have presentation in mind when you click those kilimanjaro wala picture one from a car window and one with all those things uh, because one picture is it's a fantastic outstanding sort of uh, example of photography and other one is simply one which will click by mobile phone so, while passing by in a so, car so the, i had two cameras yeah while uh, doing that so there there was one with a backup one which was my son was handling yeah so the one which you saw first was what my son was clicking okay. and one which you saw the next was what clicked yeah. <laughs> that's a typical example which a teacher would do a professor would do who would take two clicks uh, see in fact uh, i had to really run through a lot of images to connect <laughs> there uh, i didn't get it in the first yeah. place so here i found luckily one image it was actually slightly cropped just the kilimanjaro top was oh, cropped yes, yeah. otherwise it was just a plain image with the mountain it was uh, Correct, uh, yeah. you know there were no elephants or anything but we had to stop at that place for maybe about 25 minutes just to wait and see whether the elephants come how they come position ourselves talk to the driver and say and really anticipate which direction they may come and how i wanted to take the image i had to have a you know a mental frame yeah uh, you know if the if the elephant move that way then that's a different luckily they came this way which 
gave a very different dimension and, and an impact to the whole uh, you know picture. And other thing is, you had a picture of that Kenya sunset scene where there's yellow foreground and there's bluish mountains. Was that a HDR image? Ah, do you, yes, do yes. you Not do a lot of HDR? The, no, the HDR, see, the one which I have taken uh, of the horseshoe bend, you mean? No, that, not the horseshoe bend, huh? uh, the sunset scene. <coughs> there's grass, the bluish mountains. No, and no yes. Ev so, everything was bright in that. So I didn't get into the, uh, the fine, you know, one part of this thing is post-processing. <laughs> now, the pro prop, you know, a lot of people, you know, confuse post-processing with photoshopping. You know, f and there are certain ethics that we need to follow when we when we process photos. See, the the camera has a certain limitations when we shoot. Limitations can be in terms of dynamic range. In terms of dynamic range is basically nothing but in a scene, you have what is the lightest and what is the darkest that the camera can show. Yeah, that's right. uh, dynamic range of course, eyes. There is the yeah. Correct. So, so yeah, eyes have the best dynamic range, which are only l lenses of l you know of uh, today are able to come close to match. Our eyes, human eyes, is one area. Uh, dynamic range is one area where human eyes score much higher on compared to lenses. So that image was actually a sunset image. The the elephant and the grass were a little dark. Where in the Lightroom, I don't use Photoshop, I use Lightroom. I had to just bring out the detail of the dark area and lighten it, just to get that. So that in post-processing, there are two, three things that I do normally. One is adjust the contrast. Look at the little bit of the dynamic range, whether you know all the elements uh, which I have seen, which I have placed in the frame, are clearly visible or not, and adjust the by do a minor correction on the color if the color is, if the white, you know, there's some concepts like white balance, which I've not got into here, where uh, it, depending on the source of the light, the color turns out in the camera. So some of those I tweak. Uh, in, in fact, Lightroom is something which I've started using it just a year back. Before that, even I didn't have that. Uh, you know, I was using normal Picasa, ka, Google Picasa, they have some little tools to adjust. That's it. So, yes, uh, uh, dynamic range, especially when it comes to landscape photography, I use a little bit. I started using filters also, which uh, you know, which uh, gives you a, which gives you on-field control of the dynamic range rather than post-processing. And one question, Gautam, yeah. uh, would you be able to kind of conduct a workshop yes. for us? Because you know, if we get our own cameras and then have a more user friendly experience. So one is conceptual, then to drill the concepts into our minds and yeah. translate that into action. Yeah. Would it be, and would it interest the audience as well if we have a workshop? Pardon me? Yeah, mobile, uh, you know, using mobile. Even, even using the mobile, I think, see, one of the, again, fundamental things is about learning the composition pieces. How do we compose images? How do we look at images? See, <laughs> when we compose images, you know, a lot of times we get confused on what we want to really highlight. You know, we want everything in the scene, or are we, you know, looking at a particular aspect or a particular interesting element? A lot of times that gets very cluttered, and then you, the end, you know, the, the end result is not so impactful. So getting that, that comes with a lot of practice, and you know, a lot of it also comes with a lot of experience. Experience not in terms of shooting, but our own personal experiences in a lot of things, a lot of things in life. This was a really useful session. Um, very interesting um, subject, something that I also enjoy. I have two questions. Yes. One, a little bit on your opinion of something, and two, something a bit more practical. So my yeah. first question is that when you're Taking pictures, I really enjoy taking pictures, which is why I'm here, so I'm almost, like the majority said, I also use my camera on auto mode, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope to take some experience from this and use my camera a little bit better henceforth. But often when I'm taking pictures, when I have family with me, my husband particularly often says, you're missing the movement. Why are you, why are you clicking pictures through your camera? Why don't you use your eyes to see the moment? 
Absolutely. What's your opinion on that? I mean, I also take pictures for memories for many other reasons. I enjoy it. But what's your thought on that? No, absolutely. That's a question not uh, while your husband asked you, my wife, my wife asked me too, <laughs> so often, so, so many times. So, so that's a question. No, it's a good question. Because, see, uh, it all depends on what kind of time you're having. When you are, a lot of times we are in a rush. And if, if, if it's me, I find it really difficult to resist the temptation to go and do a click. Very, very difficult. But when you have time, like you know, uh, the horseshoe bend shot which I should, took, uh, I told my wife and kids to go, you, you guys go and enjoy whatever you want to do. I'm sitting here, I'm staying here for the next one and a half hours, just to enjoy the sunset as well as shoot the pictures. So if I have that kind of a time, yes, you, you tend to absorb the, the scene in front of you. But you see, Static subjects, probably you may have, you may have the time to, and luxury to enjoy the scene also. Moving subjects, very difficult. Like when you talk to Tiger, what is the... Absolutely. The, I mean, the tiger, tiger, see, like Tiger, some, many of the times you go to safari, you don't find Tigers in four, five, six safaris. Sometimes it's so rare. Sometimes it's like your first safari, you're seeing three Tigers, four Tigers. So it's all a matter of luck. And when you are in that situation where I haven't seen the tiger for the last three safaris, this is my last safari, and I have to bloody see it, and then as well as you know, capture it. So it's very, very difficult. Very, so yes, I do agree there. Uh, but it all depends on how you want to enjoy. How, For me, for example, say I've shot, if I shot a lot of tigers, and I go to a park, Again, and I see tigers, maybe one or two more shots, but I will slowly, you know, draw myself back and say, okay, I've shot enough tigers, <laughs> let me enjoy the scene. Probably the first time when you're seeing something, it's going to be very, very difficult to have that temptation. Second question? My second question is on storage. Um, a practical question, obviously, if you're taking, <laughs> yes. if you're taking pictures of scenery, I mean, if, like suns, I like taking landscapes, so I take like 50, 60 pictures of landscape oh. um, of sunset, for example, and when you get home, you download everything. Yes. You've got like 50 images. You choose maybe one or two, you upload some here, there for family, right. friends. Right. The rest, your tendency is you delete, but sometimes you keep, and that builds up, right? You've got one holiday, you've taken 100 or 200 or 300 pictures. Right. You select a few and then you store them, but th the size of these images are quite large. Yes. So holiday after holiday, image after image, you've got lots of files. How do you store them? So there are two ways I look at them. I mean, it, that's also a, a, a very challenging uh, you know, aspect. There are two ways I'm look, I do that storage. One is uh, I do on cloud, I upload. So that there's a there's a there's a record that I have which is not uh, not just in my you know uh, control. I may lose it. I may lose the hard disk or something like that. My computer may crash. Whatever. I have it on cloud. Uh, and some of the most uh, important ones, I have backups. The backups again, you know, you tend to accumulate a lot of junk. And it, it is, it's a question of discipline, how you want to cut out the junk uh, after every tour, retain the, the most good ones, have them at one or two backups. So I had recently, even I have bought another backup to have a backup of the backup. So that, you know, you know some of the most precious ones uh, are never lost. Because see, if, you, if there was fire, you know, probably that's the first thing I'll grab. <laughs> My wife is listening, but she may, she may, she may question me. She may question my motivations uh, later uh, after this uh, session. But yes, uh, you know, backups, deleting, lot of junk, is the only way. And if you do that immediately after the trip, when you are, you know, organizing your images, well and good. If you don't do that, like I have accumulated for many some. Last, you know, two years back, many, many images which are junk. So I had to literally cut many of them. Uh, it took me a long time. It took me a lot of effort. Any other question? 
Last, last question because... Yeah. I agree with what the lady had said. I can resonate the same uh, thoughts because Varun knows it, you know. I try to click a lot of pictures and then they get fed up. And they say, Mama, you are always, you know, the kids will saying that you are always, you know, trying to not look at the moment, but trying to capture the images. Mm -hmm. But the other aspect comes in that when I'm not using on the auto mode and I'm trying to set it, you know, according to what I feel, it takes me a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And suddenly everyone gets jittery, you know, why don't you click it, why don't you, you know, just end it up. Mm -hmm. And it's taking a while, mm -hmm. so they lose interest. Mm -hmm. And then what do I get back to do is like clicking the landscapes mm -hmm. or clicking the you know, still images. Yeah, but uh, the, pro uh, the pro problem comes when you start experimenting when you are on an important tour. You know, you start and you are really r rushing for time. You, you have... You know, you have maybe half an hour to spend here, your family is there, and you're having beautiful scenes to be seen. Uh, and at the same time, if you start experimenting with your, you know, then you are lost it. You will neither enjoy your pictures nor the scene. So, so the good thing is, experiment it when you have time. No, take normal subjects, take, you know, take subjects near your house, take, you know, take out time. Do a few of these things, shots. Look at how the different settings impact what. And then slowly start experimenting on field. Otherwise, with the, see, uh, it, it takes a lot of practice, to be honest. Uh, even I had lost many precious moments, uh, you know, enjoying some precious moments while doing this, when I used to travel. But, but in the hindsight, when I look at it, probably that was worth it when I could pick up you know, the nuances of it, uh, nuances of all those controls. Uh, and, uh, you know, to a stage where it's, it's starting to become a instinctive, instinctive you know, set, setting that I can, fat, 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 I'm able to set and shoot. It takes a lot, lot, lot of so practice. workshop is required. That's yeah, a workshop. That, that very much is, but not here. A workshop we is required. We would have to do it somewhere outside. A workshop is required. In fact, unfortunately, I have not. Uh, Done any workshops? You also have certain settings which you can set manual one, manual two, manual three. Okay, that for learning type of uh, people. So, so, so there was one particular slide which was there. Uh, uh, I don't know. A quick one. I will just see if it's here. No. Oh yeah. yeah. Yes, it's here. So you have the DSLR, you have these four basic settings. <coughs> Program auto, aperture control, shutter, manual. So here basically, and, and rest are scene modes and auto mode. So here, the camera, program auto, you set it, the camera tells you what shutter speed and aperture you will have for a scene. You take aperture priority, the camera will tell you you set, you have control on the aperture, the camera will set the rest of the parameters. You do shutter speed, priority, the camera will set the rest of the other, th other than shutter speed. And manual, everything is your control. Everything your... So, at many times, you need to know which mode to use also. Suppose for birds or, uh, you know, if the light is really low, I, I try to see if I can use as much as possible aperture. I need more aperture. Control. I need to, you know, set the maximum aperture. So, if you see this, uh, this little chart gives you a lot of things which are very useful. Uh, you know, when it comes to night uh, shots or slow moving subjects, uh, this is the range of shutter speed that you require. When you when it's fast moving subjects, one by 500 second to one by 2000 second, that's the setting. Uh, you know, similarly for ISO. So, so depending on the scene, you choose a mode. Normally. Uh, these are the two most used modes. Uh, if it is a static subject, mostly manual. If it's a moving subject, it's shutter. If it's a low light or, uh, you know, bird kind of subjects, aperture. That's the... I think we'll uh, call it off. Yes. Thanks a lot, um, Gautam. It was a fantastic session.
Um, I think uh, Gautam deserves a big round of applause for bringing alive this subject for us. Thank you so much, Gautam. I never realized it would be so fascinating, so interesting. Wonderful. Thanks. I just noticed and I was overwhelmed by the fact that Gautam, if you started with one subject of knowledge, say photography, and or you start with, started with ornithology or birds, what I was trying to see is how every, all the pieces of knowledge connect with each other. So for children especially, since children are here, it's very important to, if you develop interest in one area, the interest will spread and you'll be able to touch various things in life. So get passionate about things <laughs> for children. <laughs> Thank you, thank you.